Um, so hi everyone and welcome to tonight's conversation which launches the new standards lecture series this autumn. Um, the series aims to identify and confront some of the barriers to architecture, its education and practice and consider how these can be overcome to embrace wider forms of creativity. Each event in the series will address the idea of comfort and challenge the idea of standards as a bare minimum or one size fits all approach. Together, we hope to question how we might better provide comfort in all its nuanced forms. The series has evolved out of a workshop that we organized with Barbara Penner, out of uh, another workshop that Joss Boyce organized a few years ago. And we ended up holding it as an AA Bartlett collaboration to look at how space standards are based around primarily American white male militarized bodies that a majority of us in this room do not conform to. So if this is the underlying principle behind the design of most spaces, how can they ever hope to be inclusive? One of the main drivers behind this series was to examine how we can move beyond words and, and turn the many urgent conversations in the public program into action. So the series will act as a testbed for future AA events to hopefully make all events and other aspects of AA life more accessible going forward as we adjust what is considered the norm. The series will continue next term with a charrette in February that invites teams made up of participants in the series alongside students, tutors, and AA staff to design and build interventions in the AA, as well as new policy suggestions to make it a more comfortable place for everyone. The charrette will be documented and put forward to the, to the school as suggestions that could catalyze long-term change. And we hope that this will make meaningful change in the future to make our spaces much more inclusive. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mani J. Verghese. And I'm Harriet Jennings. Um, and together we've been planning this series for a few months um, with the hope of widening the conversation about what makes an inclusive space. Um, we'd like to give a special mention to Jordan Whitewood Neal for the conversation, collaboration and guidance that helped shape this series here at the AA. So um, I'll introduce our speakers quickly. Um, uh, the first speaker will be Chris Lang, who is an architectural designer, activist and consultant, who is keen to facilitate engagement and opportunities between the deaf community and the spatial and architecture practice industry. And he currently works at Howard Tompkins. And then Poppy Leverson um, is an architecture student at Central St. Martins and a part one architectural assistant at DSDHA. And finally, we'll be joined by Aaron Williamson, who is an artist whose practice is informed by his experience of becoming deaf and by a politicized yet humor humorous sensibility towards disability. Um, his public space performances celebrate deaf gain as opposed to hearing loss. So um, in tonight's conversation, um, we'll all consider the senses in art and architectural education and practice. Chris will present his work with Sign Strokes and the Deaf Architecture Front. Poppy will share her experiences as a blind student and discuss how architecture can benefit from decentering visual. And Aaron will talk about the philosophy of access. And we hope that after their presentations, um, we'll have an open conversation around this table. Um, and we hope it will be quite informal and comfortable. So um, do feel free to kind of come and join us if you feel comfortable doing so. And also um, you can eat and drink throughout the evening. Um, but before we hand over to the speakers, just to make everyone aware that um, we have British Sign Language interpretation um, this evening. So a big thank you to Amy and Anne who are sitting opposite us for joining tonight. Um, there are also ramps in place outside the buildings and accessible toilets are available through this door um, in the corner there. Uh, we also have a quiet room if you should need it at any point, which is just through those doors opposite me. Um, and yes, we've kept the windows open, so we apologise if it's a bit chilly, but we don't. Yeah, the idea is that we'd like people who are still vulnerable to COVID to feel safe attending. And there's some more spaced out seating on this side of the room if you would like it. Um, so please feel free to come up to either me or Manashe tonight if you need anything at all. Um, and I will now hand over to Chris for the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. It's a real opportunity to talk to you all and to discuss sign strokes.
So what is sign strokes? Sign strokes is a lexicon of BSL architectural terms. It's language that's used by interpreters and the deaf community. And it's the first in its kind in the UK. The idea is to build upon and expand upon this knowledge and develop this as the time goes on. So my name is Chris Lang. I work at Half Tompkins. I've worked there for over five years now. I finished my part two recently at the RCA. And I also co-founded Sign Strokes with Adolf Christophoons, who was studying his part one and part two at Central St. Mark's. Uh, Adolf works at Pilbara Brow and Partners. And I can give you a little bit of background about us both if you'd like. Ados was born deaf. His native sign language user is Latvian. And four generations of sign language users as well in his family. Why did I create sign strokes? Really to fill a gap, a missing void. There's no corpus or lexicon or guidance that's been set up in the UK that has architectural terms that can be used in education or by young people who are wanting to learn about architecture. So really that means that there was a lot of barriers in enabling to gain access to study. So there were a number of things that influenced establishing sign strokes. In my workplace at Howard Tompkins, I set up a workshop to teach people BSL terms in the workplace. And there was nothing that was established for architectural terms. Also at the same time, Ados was studying his part two at CSM and was researching different sign terms for architectural terms. And so at the same time, we thought let's combine this and establish sign strokes, which was only two years ago. So there were a number of people that were involved in the process and setting up sign strokes. We had uh, very valuable funding from Half Tompkins and they have been invaluable and very supportive throughout. They also gave us the opportunity to engage with the BSL linguist, as well as work with knowledge exchange at CSM. It meant that we could start the project rolling. We worked with Dr. Kate Rowley who works at UCL at DECAL. It meant that we were able to create a workshop where we could work out how to create a lexicon and create different signs for the terms. And this was through sign strokes. It was really important to work with Dr. Kate Rowley because she knows how to formulate language in a way that's approved and has a thorough method. So we had a number of strategies that we used to create the language. The first one was the C shape or the cube shape that you can see here, or the family hand shape. So there were a number of signs that would be left that would be used from that space. So for instance, section or envelope or floor. The second strategy adopted was using two signs that became one. So for instance, this is a sign for posh and the sign that I've just used there is for taking over. <laughs> so we just turned that into gentrification. Wow. In addition, when we were thinking about how to create a sign for the term truss, we thought of first of all, the word, the word roof and the sign for roof and the word beam and combine those into truss. The third strategy was about being very clear and having visibility in context. So for instance, cantilever. Visually, it looks like cantilever and also topography. So when we're thinking about the shape of a landscape, we use a sign to denote the meaning of that, of that term. The workshop that we established was wonderful. It was a beautiful experience. There were a lot of deaf people there and it meant that lots of people who had no background in architecture would be able to contribute to establishing the different signs. So it was a lot of discussion and over 30 to 40 different terms were discussed over a period of three hours. 
And it meant at the end that there was agreements about which, which signs would be used for which terms. The process was, was amazing and it's something that we will do again. And, and Dr. Kate Rowley was also involved with that as well. These are all the terms that all have been agreed um, and signs agreed for them. The ones that are highlighted in red that you can see there um, are on Instagram and you can access them. Um, we haven't yet turned all of those terms into videos because we need further funding to be able to go to the next step. So I wonder whether you could try and follow me when I'm using some of these signs now. So this is architect, architect, as in the person, architect. This is person, architect, architect. The other is agency. So an intervention made or empowering someone to have agency. And this is atrium, atrium. And lastly, master plan or master plan, master plan, yeah. In the future, our hopes are that we will be able to create a corpus. So that means that we will be able to establish a greater amount of terms that can be used in practice. And so that a wider spectrum of people can access them and learn from them. It also means that people that are learning um, in different educational environments and also interpreters can gain access to this reserve resource as well. So that could be in lectures, for instance, or in different university settings, as well as studios uh, in practice. And my colleagues will be able to use this as well. <clears throat> There's so many signs that are yet to have been um, created, for instance, here, brutalism and also Gable. So if you have any ideas about what these could be, just direct message me and what I could do is save those. So when we have the next workshop, I can put those towards um, an idea that we could then we can then use to create the sign video. The idea is that sign strokes will keep, keep on going and developing. And it's really important to remember that Oh, so for instance, one person direct messaged me um, and was like, this is invaluable. This is really, really important because this is helping my practice. So if one person is impacted positively, then I think, you know, this could be a resource that could help a lot more people. So that's the aim going forward. I just want to show you a quick video. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. And now over to you, Poppy. Great. Um, do you need me to lean in at all or anything? Okay, cool. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Poppy. Um, I thought I'd start by just doing a very brief explainer on blindness because I've realized it's something that most people don't know that much about. Um, so 93% of blind people have some vision, which is quite surprising to a lot of people. I'm one of those people, so I have some usable vision, um, but it can range from anything from just like light perception to color. So if you see me looking at my phone, it's because I do have some usable vision and I'm not faking being blind, which is the usual one I get. 
Um, so the way I kind of think about blindness in architecture is that there's sort of two sides to it at the moment. There's the sort of more practical side of how accessible is architecture to blind people at the moment? And then there's what potential do blind people have to like bring things to architecture and improve architecture? Um, so I'm going to start with the slightly more boring to most people, which is the how practical is it to be in architecture as a blind person? Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we face at the moment is the attainment for blind students and vision impaired students is really low, which means that you're coming out of school and it's so hard to get into architecture school. Most places ask for like A's and B's, which just might not happen. I mean, I myself got an A star, an A and an E in my A levels. And most people are quite surprised by that when they meet me. But I think you can guess which course didn't make it accessible for me. <laughs> Um, I was really lucky with Central St Martins because they embrace the fact that they take people with lower predicted grades and when I went to my open day, I'm hoping it's still the same now, they said that they try to look at everyone's application even if they don't meet the entry requirements. On top of that, they also interviewed, which whilst it isn't the best for everyone, for me it meant that I could actually show off who I am, I could show off how passionate I am about the subject. And I am convinced that that's what got me the place because it wasn't straightforward. Um, and the other thing that comes with that low attainment, unfortunately, is a sort of low self-esteem. There was a time that I genuinely didn't think I'd get into an architecture degree, which most of my friends find quite shocking now because I won't shut up about architecture. <laughs> um, and that really is the first of the battles. Like when I then started university, all the fun started. Um, the first time I met my disability advisor, I was told, oh, I'm more used to dealing with dyslexic students. I don't really know anything about blindness. And so I was left in a position where not only was I having to do the degree, I was working out how to do the degree and then having to fight to be able to do it in that way. And whilst the department at my university have been very supportive, the structures in place at the university, the bureaucracy made it really difficult. And on top of that, with COVID, everything became increasingly visual. Everything was online. And that was very tricky for me. The biggest barriers I face at the moment is that none of the software that we use, none of the CAD, none of the auto, like um, Adobe has any accessibility settings. And when you search for these things, it kind of comes up with how to make stuff for disabled people. It's never how can disabled people use the software. And when I've spoken to these companies, they've kind of gone, oh, well, there aren't any blind people in architecture. Um, and one of the big issues that I faced is that the few blind people that are in architecture generally went blind after already being established architects. And so they can kind of get by by being quite gestural with their work and working with other people who can then create their work, which just isn't viable for someone going through architecture school or someone who's entry level in the profession. Like we have to acknowledge that when you're a part one architectural assistant, you're just doing the jobs that people ask you to do. You can't be like, I'm an ideas person. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been a tricky one and I've had to kind of work out how to do things and it's emotionally draining. That's the thing people often don't realize is there were times when I was spending a whole day a week, which if you do architecture, you know you're already very busy. I was spending a whole day a week just working out my access requirements and getting things in place. So that's the huge bar barrier that is facing blind people. And on top of that, there's virtually no representation. So very few people think I'm gonna go and do architecture. For me, it came alongside the um, learning about the social model of disability, um, which if you're not familiar with, is the concept that it's not our innate impairment that makes us disabled, it's the world around us and other people's attitudes. And for me, I saw architecture as a way that I can make a really big difference because architecture plays such a pivotal role in the social model of disability. But now onto the bit that more people are interested in, which is what blind people can bring to architecture. Um, and I think there is so much potential here, but it's difficult to explore as I found during my degree because everything we do has to fit within the Reba accreditations, which are currently very narrow. You have to be able to make a plan in a particular way. 
you have to know certain things and you have to have certain outcomes. And whilst I completely understand that, there needs to be room and there needs to be some flex to do things in alternative ways and new methods of doing things. I think there's a lot of room to explore how we talk about architecture and how we describe architecture. Um, I know there have been cases at university where I've been told to stop writing things down and start drawing. But for me, that's how I think about things. Everything is in my head. I, I don't think through sketching in the same way sighted people do. <laughs> Um, and I've also been told, oh, the more the more you do architecture, the more you'll draw things. And it's this kind of attitude that the visual is the correct way of doing things. Um, and architecture is so ocular centric. I mean, if you read things like The Eyes of the Skin, you'll hear Yuhani Palazma talking about how we're, incre we're very visual and we've become increasingly visual through the years. And I think this has only um, increased during the pandemic. As architecture students, all of our work was through digital hand-ins. There wasn't room to make physical models. And I mean, we saw this with companies. They were getting new photos taken of their buildings because they needed what is essentially content at the end of the day to shout about their buildings. But none of this is, none of this is accessible to me. I mean, there's no alt text. There's no image description, there's no audio description on videos, and a lot of the books aren't accessible. So I think when we talk about like phenomenology, for example, with Yohani Palasma, he's not talking about it from a disabled perspective. He's a non-disabled man. Um, and so I think hopefully as we get more blind people into the profession, we'll be able to explore some of the more creative ways and embrace our differences. Um, I've been lucky enough to be part of the Architecture Beyond Sight course at the Bartlett, which was run by Disordinary Architecture and Joss Boys, who has already been mentioned. And I think what I learned when I took part in the course was that it is so much better if we can embrace our differences rather than do what unfortunately I have to do at the moment, which is try and act as though I'm a sighted architect. And I think we need to get the first point that I've made done before we can get to the second point, because me as an individual, I cannot change the way we do things in architecture. I cannot make the profession less visual on my own. Um, but whilst the profession is so inaccessible, it's going to be really hard to do that. So, yeah, that's my piece. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, that, okay, yeah. And um, yeah, I'll just briefly introduce what I'm going to show, and then I'll do a little bit of audio description as well. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah um, well, the invitation for manager came to me to talk a little bit about comfort and the idea of comfort and things like that. And I really can't. I don't have any experience of that, really. I mean, my work is all about troublemaking and disruption. I'm a performance artist and I work in public situations. And most of my work is about trying to challenge architects and environments to, um, to accommodate problems that I put in front of them. So that's my brief, really. I get commissioned work internationally to um, disrupt architectural spaces. So that's what I can do. <laughs> that's why managers invited me. <laughs> Thank you, manager. Okay, so um, right. So uh, I mean, uh, oh, obviously, I'm a politically disabled person, and experience uh, exclusion and inaccessibility will cross my lap. So uh, the way I deal with that is instead of talking about inclusive space. I uh, make exclusive places and sort of flip the whole thing on its head. I'm going to show you a short film, which is about five minutes long. Um, and it's a silent film, it's got no sound. And while the film is going on, then I'll probably talk about a few issues that crossed my mind while I was making it. It's, uh, it was about, made about 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, they've already got it out. And um, yeah, for visual impaired people amongst us, um, just a brief 
audio description introduction is that I closed down the city of Liverpool with um, a few volunteer students who had a wheelbarrow and was all wearing um, high visibility vests and had wheelbarrows full of cones and barrier tape. And we had no commission or authority to do this. So over five hours, we went around Liverpool and um, um, we put barriers to inclusion foods in shopping centres and things like that and see how the public would react to it. And uh, I mean, did, we only ended up with about five minutes of footage because the police kept coming over and shutting us down and asking us to move on. And so it was quite a complicated performance, really. And then I got arrested. And the high point of the film was when I closed down Take Liverpool in the Take Gallery in Liverpool for about 20 minutes or something like that. And um, I'm just hoping it might be of interest to uh, architects because um, uh, I can't help but observe that social inclusion has is, is, become much more related to security these days. And I suppose that relates to comfort as well. And um, it kind of takes fun out of things in some ways. Uh, uh, safe spaces and all of this sort of thing is um, it's not what I grew up with. I grew up as a working class person in Derby in Midlands and, uh, and uh, it's a bit like the Wild West, you know. And so, um, so I just want you to, as an architect, to think about and observe about um, obedience in public spaces versus rebellion, I guess. And so if we can stop the film, I'll, I'll talk a little bit over it. Now what? As I said, it's a silent film. No. Oh. And um, a lot of people, just because it's wearing high visibility vests, came and asked me, do you know the direct? I don't know Liverpool at all. So people were asking me directions to places and things like that. So I was giving them misdirections. And it was quite satisfying in a lot of ways to reverse the, um, reverse the dynamic on it. Uh, this is Tate Liverpool that I closed down for 20 minutes. Um, I'd just like to put a serious note on this because it's quite a comical film, but uh, um, the University of Ottawa in Canada recently published a disability advisory document and it was based on um, asking people, disabled people, what were the five barriers to accessibility? And the number one barrier to accessibility was the attitudinal barrier. And... Um, and the attitudinal barrier may consist in stereotyping, um, 
special treatments and favors, low expectations, and exceptionalism. And so way back in the day when I thought about calling in deaf gay, it was pr primarily based on an idea of an attitudinal gay that, uh, that I was transforming towards refusing to perceive myself as being inferior to women people or non-disabled people. So that was like a quite a political intervention into society. And so um, how do we confront attitudinal barriers? And uh, the way I've dealt with that down the years is to follow the idea of quick humour, to deliver a satire that exposes people's ignorances and prejudice. Um, just quite a serious point to make. I mean, I guess you all know about um, Satya Baron Cohen's work, because allergy and Barat and all of that sort of thing, which is like playing a deadpan confrontation towards the public and seeing how they re react to it. And you'd be surprised at the uh, level of credulity that the public has towards uh, quite outrageous premises, such as this uh, barrier man idea. Um, recently, I've started formalizing this investigation more in terms of investigating how architects think about crowd flows, behavioral systems, and uh, inclusion, uh, all of the sort of thing. Um, and it's a fascinating subject, but it seems to me that it's, in, it's this kind of top-down idea from um, being able to predict human behaviour and control it as well. Okay, so this film's finished. Yeah, okay, so I just wanted to end it up on a, on a little bit of anecdote, if I can, right, to review this, uh, this thinking behind the quick humour idea and uh, just um, I mean oftentimes I'm sure Chris experiences the same thing we, we go in public and it's so laborious I'm going to say you know my name is Aaron and then followed by I am deaf but I can lip read and I probably say that about 20 30 times a day you know if I'm out and about I thought about changing my name too yeah but I can lip read. So I thought about changing it, but I did pull so that if I go to the airport or whatever, I just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, deaf, <laughs> I'm deaf, <laughs> but I can lip read. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so this time, you know. So that's an example of um, strip humor. And then again, much uh, oftentimes people ask quite prurient, intrusive, nosy questions about, oh, how did you come, become deaf in the first place? And so I've been so bored explaining that it's a genetical inheritance from my granddad who was also deaf. So instead of saying that, because I've been saying that for years and years, I um, make up really entertaining stories that, oh, well, I had an alien abduction at the age of eight and um, it didn't go very well. And, uh, <laughs> or, um, what's the other one? Oh, a lifestyle choice, obviously, you know. Um, and so I start just to keep myself um, in the business of remaining interesting in social spaces, I suppose. Yeah, and then, um, right, well, and then uh, we've got loads of anecdotes and I haven't got time, I'm running out of time, but uh, years ago it was, uh, living in Bromley by about uh, in an artist studio complex and um, I was going home very late at night and this little ginger kid jumped in front of me brandishing a knife and he was going ah, shut in the face and uh, and I was didn't I said oh, I don't know what you're saying I'm, I'm deaf I'm deaf but I can live with <laughs> and he said uh, give me a minute I said I don't understand I'm, I'm deaf and he said and this little kid said with his nerves said oh you're deaf and I said, yeah, he said, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. And he went on. So I can't even get mad. <laughs> and OK, you think, can we have one more? Yeah. 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 Well, I collaborated <laughs> with Katharina Waniero, a wheelchair user, which is disabled, I haven't got for many years. And we caused a lot of trouble everywhere, you know, it's like nowhere was inaccessible for it because Catherine was just wheelchair 
half a ton of wheelchair and just claimed to have run out of battery on it. And then I'd be saying, where are the interpreters? I can't get through here. So everybody went around trying to find interpreters for me and things like that. Well, one night we were staying at the Beatles Hotel in Liverpool. And it was, I hate the Beatles. And it was um, Beatles Musical Night. And we was having this dinner with all of our written new world carers. Like I had two interpreters in cafe and had someone to hold a lot of fags for and hold a drink up for. She had two, two chihuahua dogs. And we all had like a massive face together. And just gave it away from us was this um, quite ordinary couple, really, a salaryman and his wife with two kids. And they were staring at us all night. And I, uh, we was like champagne, more food, and uh, having a great big party in this Beatles restaurant, you know. And then um, and then uh, we were really worried about how much this was going to cost. So we were terrified. And uh, the, uh, the waiter came up to us and said, can we have a bill? Uh, and, um, and he said, well, did you notice that family was sitting over the way from you? And he said, yeah, they were really rude to us all night staring with their silly little kids and, and you know, all the rest of it. And they said, well, anyway, they paid you a bill on the way out. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you, all three of you, so much for uh, such really open, honest, and generous presentations, um, and also for giving us an insight into your practice, into the some of the obstacles you've had to overcome in order to study architecture, um, but also I think really opening our eyes up into like how we can sign and, you know, how architecture, we can have an expanded vocabulary also to like learn more about how we can talk about architecture in, in new and interesting ways. Um, I think we really want everyone to engage in the conversation. Um, so we're hoping that this can become, despite having to hold this microphone, this can become a more informal conversation. Um, so I think the bigger question we wanted to talk about for the rest of today is can, how can we as designers adopt a multi-sensory approach in order to design an experience space more inclusively? And this really came out of the fact that I think as, as Poppy really clearly described, so much of education and practice just exists and then everyone who has a disability is supposed to adapt to it rather than it actually being designed from the outset to be inclusive for everyone. And so what are the ways, and it'd be really interesting, I guess, to, to hear from the three of you, but also from everyone in the audience, if you have ideas on, um, especially having heard the three presentations, how you think we could learn about architecture, design architecture and experience and inhabit architecture differently. Yeah, here, excellent. Hey, um, thanks very much. I have a very quick question. Um, you talk, Chris was talking about BSL um, and, I was, and you were talking about your colleague who's from Latvia and the generational understanding of sign language in his family. And I was, this is for all the speakers. I was curious if there is a, um, if there are other countries who do do this better that we should be looking at. I feel here in America if we were to add it to, I think the UK does have the advantage. For instance, access to work. Uh, there is access to work budgets. That means that interpreters can be in the workplace. And in America, there's less so or very few accessible options there. Um, I have an interpreter with me every day at work, for instance, because I'm here in the UK. I think there's over 300 different sign languages in the world. Um, so, you know, there's international sign language. Um, when I meet people that are deaf and use sign language, native sign language users, and I hear their experiences, I do realize how lucky I am here in the UK. Um, about places that do it better. 
Um, I think, unfortunately, there's just not enough of us. Um, like the most prominent blind architect is probably Chris Downey from the US, um, who lost his sight at the age of about 50. And so I think the way that I've sort of, he, I've met him, he was one of the tutors on the Architecture Beyond Sight course when I was there, and he's really great. But I think, like I mentioned before, there's uh, there's got to be this appreciation that as a non-disabled, uh, coming from being a non-disabled privileged white man in America who went through architecture and went through architecture education as a sighted person um, and then had a practice and was working high up in practice when he then lost his sight meant that he could just turn into this sort of ideas man and he just sort of gets his drawings embossed which is really really great um, and then he sort of gives feedback on them and then someone else does the work but that currently isn't a viable route for people to come into architecture. Um, and because he's, there's a kind of difference between, I guess, growing up visually impaired and going blind. Um, and I think with that, he, he accepts not doing certain things. Whereas I'm coming from a position of like, I want to be able to do everything. Um, and I want to be able to do as much of it as possible by myself. Um, and that's something that's kind of much more acknowledged in the deaf community. Um, there's sort of differential def differentials based on if you became deaf and if you grew up in the deaf community and things, which the same isn't done in the blind community. And I think um, like a lot of the work that like Aaron's done and stuff, the blind community is way, way behind the deaf community in that way, um, which makes it a lot more difficult to sort of acknowledge these differences and privileges that come from being in different places and from diff like different attitudes. But yeah, I think the biggest problem at the moment is there's just not enough of us to be able to go, someone's doing it really well. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe it'll be the UK soon. <laughs> yeah. I was really struggling to find a role model. You know, a deaf black man um, that would be a role model or even an architect that I could aspire to become. There's only four, five qualified architects in the country that are deaf. So it's difficult to find a role model that then can empower the younger generations who are coming through. And also if your first language is BSL, native BSL user, and I'm having to access everything in English and text, it means that there is that barrier there at the very start. I think that that's what I would describe as a game because um, a game. what fight, what fight to, <coughs> to form your own identification. And it took me till I was 30 before I started going into public places and being able to say, you know, I'm deaf because I was always like, what a feeling before then, I was going dead slowly. And so it was like, it was a a process whereby I had to, I guess, come out, you know. Yes. So for me, that was a game. I understand that it's a game. But if I think about identity, you know, and I think about the lack of resources and also communication, how you get that pride, you know, I was quite lucky that members of my family learned sign language, um, but there are lots of families where young deaf people and their parents have language barriers because the parents don't learn sign languages. So finding empowerment um, is really important, but I understand why you think it's a, it's a game. Yeah, I think that kind of comes on to a similar point as well, where um, I kind of view myself in some ways as lucky where I didn't have the choice but to disclose my disability at university. Um, but I think architecture is so um, exclusionary that a lot of people that can pass as non-disabled don't disclose their disability. And that comes with a lack of pride in their own disability as well in some cases, particularly with newly disabled people um, combined with the exclusionary industry. Um, but there's kind of two sides of that. Like, yes, I'm really pleased that I have to, because it doesn't give me the choice. Um, but there's a lot of work that comes with that. And there's discrimination that comes with that as well. 
um, with that not being able to choose whether I want people to know or not um, is really difficult. And whilst I'm really proud to be blind and I'm really pr proud to be a blind person in architecture, um, there's a lot of work that goes with that. I think if I can pick up, if I can pick up on that a little bit, it's, um, I think with all of this idea about inclusivity and about how architects can deliver and respond to that, one of the biggest challenges to architecture is to understand that the disability community exists along the spectrum and that there is no definitive points on which you can say, okay, we've solved the problem for these people, we've solved the problem for these people, and so on and so forth. I mean, as an educator in recent years, the most um, dramatic emergence um, within the university system has been neurodivergency. And, um, and people who identify on the spectrum of neurodivergency have ex extraordinarily, extraordinarily divergent experiences. And so, like, I think there is no kind of like a, a one shot remedy from an architectural position to address this. And not a problem, it's a thing, not address a problem, but address an opportunity. Definitely. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Calvin. Um, I'd just like to follow on uh, Chris's point about how, I guess, in workplaces and perhaps educational institutions, there are some budgets or some resources, even though it's limited, to support a more inclusive experience. But I guess at a place like the AA, kind of the informal social kind of activities are as much part of the educational experience as the formal teaching um, experience. And I was wondering how we could make those more inclusive as well, um, because obviously those things are happening outside the institutional remit. Also, I felt within architecture that there's a lot of barriers where there is a loss to, to access and a loss to rights. You know, there's lots of opportunities that I can't gain access to because there is no provision that I don't feel welcome to, that I'm not immediately in included in because everything is either very text heavy or there isn't any BSL content. There isn't any BSL translation. So you, you, I would agree that everything needs to be a lot more welcoming. And the experience of people, for instance, who are hearing that go to a place or a working environment is very different from one of a deaf person. Because if, for instance, somebody wanted to have a work experience or internship, there is no budget for interpreters to be present, where there would be no money needed and no budget needed if you were hearing. So already there is that difference and there is that lack of access, just in a simple experience of work experience and practice. So it starts there as well. If you want young deaf children to become architects, then events need to be BSL interpreted and they need to be accessible. Really, it's about access for all. And it means that there needs to be BSL at every single event. I remember having a conversation with someone who said there's only one BSL tour. So it was tokenism. And I was like, no, all the events need to be BSL interpreted and BSL accessible. It can't just be one. It's this attitude that one is enough. One event is enough, not all of them. So there's lots of different areas in which that is a situation. For instance, if we think about a public consultation. If there's no interpreter at a public consultation, and how are you to gain access as a deaf person? If everything is very text heavy and English focused, nothing has been translated into BSL, then how do you gain that access as a person living in the community? How do you take part in the process? Um, I'm just picking up on that a little bit, but uh, I mean, the whole uh, experience I have, which is the university, we have diversity weeks, and we talk about diversity between people and how to address diversity in practical terms. But I think the mistake is in fact that diversity is often treated as an homogenous idea that there's only one kind of diversity, <laughs> which is paradoxical, really. Um, and we think about a diverse diversity, if you like. Um, so the homogenous diversity is um, 
is the prevalent idea at the moment. But I think what I would say to architects is that uh, the more it's a, it's a massive wide open scope for invention and exploration to see diversity as a massive opportunity to come up with all kinds of different systems and ideas that are even for forms of diversity that don't necessarily even exist at the moment. And that's how I work as an artist. I imagine situations that don't actually exist. So I just put that on the table, really, about um, if you're dealing with um, solving diversity, then you're looking at it from the wrong position. I, I think that's a great point about, I think, also the attitude that things should be solved. Um, I don't think there is one solution. And I think a big part of organizing this series was to have this conversation about why we want to standardize everything. Um, when the st often the standards to address one, like to make space more inclusive for one group of people, exclude another group of people, rather than thinking about comfort for everyone. Um, and I thought, actually, I just wanted to pick up on a point you made, Poppy, about um, the REBA criteria. Um, just because I think a lot of institutions, while it is there as a kind of standard of what should be delivered in education, it's very much open to interpretation. I should probably not admit this on camera, but when I studied here, I didn't draw a plan in three years and I, I still graduated. <laughs> I may not be an architect today, but um, I think um, there are lots of ways around that. And I think institutional resistance to interpreting that is a big barrier as well. And I'm just wondering like, in your experience, what are the ways in which collectively, so not you on your own, but as students of architecture, as tutors of architecture, could we challenge that criteria? And um, I guess qu question what architecture is, is it really just plans? It can't be. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I think a, a really big starting one would be that proof of understanding is good enough um like a lot of my barriers uh, that I faced came with creating work like I mentioned all of the software is pretty much inaccessible to me and that's not going to change anytime soon um and so there were certain things where I I know that I know them and my tutors would know that I know how to do things and I know what the standards are and the difficulty was then having to prove that I knew them by recreating them. Um, and so I think that's like a really immediate thing that can add some flexibility into how we're working, where I was almost like, I'd rather just have an exam because I work quite well on that, like, what, well, in that sort of setting where I can say, yes, I, I, I understand this stuff. Um, or even having more spoken exams as a potential, um, like uh, beavers and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it would be really interesting to explore, like with Reba, how we can work within the framework that they have. But currently their support for disabled people is absolutely dire. Um, if you're a disabled student, they've got these like three inaccessible PDFs to a blind person. Um, and they basically tell you how to apply to university as a disabled person. There's nothing specific to architecture. And to like rub it in even more, they've got these like anecdotes from these, I'm assuming fictional disabled people because <laughs> there's no names added to anything. And I'm like, there aren't, people aren't this cheery. <laughs> Just giving like really positive testimonies about what architecture school is like for a disabled person. And the reality is at the moment, it's really tough. I mean, it's really tough for everyone, but it's particularly tough for a disabled person. And so I kind of think it's even more damaging that they sort of perpetuate this narrative that, oh no, we're all fine, it's all great. Um, so I think, yeah, Reba could be doing a lot more. Um, and within that, it would be great to discuss with them what they still think qualifies you as an architect um, so that we kind of know, know the scope we've got to play with and then work from that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I would stop with my next step would be part three. And unfortunately, the, the exam is not accessible for the deaf community. So, for example, my first language is BSL, which means that reading the exam questions, I don't understand them. So, I need to have a BSL um, exam 
they should be giving the questions in BSL. So Rebus have the power to change the curriculum and to make that successful for, um, for deaf people, for the part three. Yeah, I agree. Aaron, did you have a, a different experience in, in art school? Or? I'm sorry. Oh, um, well, um, but, uh, well, that's a trend in literature, and so uh, one of the reasons uh, I got my doctorate in literature was that I only had to read books and I'd go to the lectures and sit at the back, and I had no uh, interpreting or anything like that. But I would go away and read more books than everybody else, so uh, that was good. But in art school, I think a lot of people are drawn to going to art school primarily because they don't have to necessarily have to read quite so many books and they have to make visual work. And I think that's, um, uh, I think it's a generally a, a positive experience because conceptual art, contemporary conceptual art, celebrates a kind of maverick spirit and we all want to be baffled and confused about what this art means and things like that. And so it's almost a perfect platform for uh, people come from a disability experience where they don't necessarily have to uh, program at hours their experience, but come up with something that makes you think deeper and more about complexity. And so, on that point of view, I think it's great. But in terms of physical access to many situations, then it's really bad because there's still very many public galleries that disabled people can't get into. And um, I mean, there have been so many video installations where there's no subtitles or interpreters present. And so, you know, in terms of practical access, this is all well, it's pretty shit, actually. And, um, but uh, then again, I do believe I held in there because I do believe that it's a celebration of um, difference and uh, no thinking, all of those sort of things. And I believe that this bit belongs to the future in a way that the world hasn't caught up with, which is analogous to what contemporary art is supposed to be about. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, I remember at university for the MA, it really impacted my mental health because I had to explain uh, to my disability advisor exactly what I needed. And I expected them to know, but they didn't at all. So, for example, I said I needed two interpreters and a note taker and a teach for the deaf. Unfortunately, they were trying to reduce the budget at all, this, all, all times and because it, they're saying... And they were challenging me, saying, you know, and they, they were giving me the responsibility when I was studying. So it was actually traumatic. So I could see some people just giving up their degrees because they would they couldn't fight for it. So I think you need to think about it beforehand, how to stop that happening before they get to university. Um, I think there's a question from Jordan on Zoom, right, Roshni? Does anyone over here also have a question? Or okay. a comment? Yeah. Shall I read Jordan's question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, for Poppy and Chris, did you find the environments of architectural education, such as the design studio or site, inaccessible? And what role do you think architecture schools have in, have in ensuring that these spaces work better? Um, yeah, I think um, a sort of situation that I always think is particularly funny one for me is I'll make work and then I go to a crit and I pin all my work up and then I can't see my work. And so I'm presenting a wall of work that luckily I know really well because I've just made all of it, but I can't see any of it. I can't read any of the writing. I'm having to just just really point at things that I think are in the right location. Um, and that kind of sums up architecture education for me is that at no point did I really feel like I was making work for me. I was making work for everyone else, which obviously is part of architecture education, but it would be nice to also make work that I could access. Um, but yeah, I think um, studio environments, I, I quite enjoyed when I could be in them, unfortunately. COVID impacted a lot of my education, um, which was really difficult. I found the remote stuff really hard. 
Um, and I also lost quite a bit of my sight during the same time, which made it even even more difficult because I was sat in my room trying to make work and just struggling. And as we were talking with disability advisors, I had such a battle with my first disability advisor, um, with him undermining me in meetings with other members of staff um, and basically saying that I was causing the problem because I wouldn't accept the absolutely appalling access accommodations that he tried to propose. Um, I think site visits were an interesting one. Um, it was always an environment that I struggled in. I remember particularly last year, my third year, going to site with a group of people. And I think the start of term is always kind of disorganized in architecture school. Everything's last minute. And so I could never get a site to guide with me because I'd be told the night before and I need 48 hours to get someone minimum. Um, I would often turn up and my tutors wouldn't have been told that I was blind and I'd turn up with my white cane and go, hi. <laughs> um, and luckily I'm confident in talking to people about it. I'm very open about it. So it never caused too much of an issue, but it was always a really daunting thing for me because you're going into a room and you don't know if this person is going to think, why are you here? Like I've unfortunately experienced that a bit in architecture. I've heard people say things like, why, why, why would blind people even try? I mean, I've had, I was in a Zoom call once with other disabled architects and someone said, I don't even understand how a blind person could do architecture. Um, and so you're going into this room with tutors that you don't know if they're going to accept you or not. I was lucky, I guess, or maybe we can be hopeful that that's just how most people are, that I never face that. Um, but yeah, with site visits, no one has any knowledge of blindness and I'm going off with a group of people and it was always chaotic and I'd always lose people and it was just incredibly stressful. So I tended to avoid it, which I think is really sad. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a ramble there, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot more that can be done and my experience was a problem with the disability service not helping the department. Yeah, it's the same for me. Yeah, you're always thinking about the side of the room and uh, feeling confident, and you're always nervous about it. Um, in terms of my school, if, if they're deaf, it's fine, but in university, they're all hearing, so you're always anxious about how you're going to communicate or respond to people. In terms of the... Um, the yeah, asking my CA about conversations, it made me sort of, yeah, I relied on my interpreter. I wanted my interpreter to be there. Yeah, it was a challenge. It, same in, in, the, in the room, preparing for your information. You have to make sure the interpreter's prepared. And if it's noisy in the room, the interpreter can't hear very well. So they need that for a good translation. And I remember through lockdown, it was really impacted me because it was the first time I'd used Zoom and that was a bit awkward. And you normally have in two interpreters anyway to translate. And on Zoom at that time, I didn't actually know about anything about how to pin people. And so there was a lecturer and then, and then I had to find it when they swapped interpreters, I had to find the other interpreter to pin them. And then I would lose the information. So through lockdown, I, I became absolutely exhausted because you're looking at online all day long. And, you know, I had no energy to do work after that. And tutors didn't really understand that at all. You know, they, they, they expected me to work a bit quicker. So obviously, after a lecture, I was exhausted and I had to keep explaining that. And, um, yeah, it's very easy for other people to be able to catch up, but it wasn't for me. So it was a real struggle. And that was for, um, what, two years of remote work. Um, it's been really interesting talking about the, um, and I'm totally skeptical up to endless diversity idea, but I would also put forward the idea that the psychological experience of social exclusion is pretty much the same across the board. Yeah, I mean, in a, oh no, go on, I was going to say, in a weird way, there's such an obsession with standardizing curricula or standardizing guidance for how to deal with disability. But across institutions, there doesn't seem to be any common ground around um, like how to provide support 
Uh, and it feels like from each of you talking about your experience, you were having to invent it from scratch each time rather than maybe like even, I mean, all these universities are in pretty close proximity to each other, but they're all coming up with bespoke solutions. And they don't seem to realize the need for a disability advisor to have any knowledge of the subject you're studying and the requirements of that, which seems completely um, mind boggling to me. Um, but I just like, I think, I mean, I guess, Chris, earlier you spoke about being um, like looking for role models who were both an, a deaf architect and a black man. And like, I think that intersectional approach of even just someone who's an architect and has a disability or understands the two together to be able to provide support. It seems obvious, but I guess like universities are going to just, I guess, invest in a, a advisor who can help people across a range of subjects, but maybe that's the wrong approach. And I was just wondering like where standardization or some sort of collaboration across institutions could be a good idea. Um, just as, I mean, I guess as you was, rather than saying there should be a, a bespoke approach for every, everything. That was just kind of a comment. Maybe you want to respond to that. <laughs> Shall I jump in really quickly? Yeah. Um, I just want to mention, shout out to um, Jordan Whitewood Neal, <laughs> who's on Zoom, because um, uh, I know he's doing a lot of work trying to get a disabled architects network going. Um, and um, I think that's going to be really helpful. I mean, I've already got like a little network of disabled architecture students that I'm supporting, but this is the thing, it's it's really hard to find people because, and, and a big issue, unfortunately, with um, with a lot of this stuff is GDPR, and I completely understand the need for protection of people's privacy and stuff, but like I was told by the disability advice service at my university that they couldn't put me in contact with anyone specifically because of privacy issues. Um, and so like, I've recently been contacted by a blind architecture student um, and I've known about her for over a year, but I've never been able to contact her because of privacy issues and not being able to be given contact details by anyone. So luckily we're now in, in contact, but it's just a shame that it's taken so long for this to happen. So I'm really hopeful that we can get the network set up and then have a bit more of this sharing. So not everyone has to do the work all over again, every time. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Well, I think about it, I really wish that I already had support in place to support things because I really felt that on my master's I was on my own. I had to fight, I had to campaign, I had to all the way through explain my my in, in my master's on my first three terms about what was needed. You know, there was a lacking in support. And I really think that it's very important that disability advisors have the knowledge and experience. I shouldn't have been asking the questions that I was. I shouldn't have been doing the research that I was. And that's their role to do that. And that's part of the responsibility of the university to provide that service. You know, there was a moment where I thought, should I give up? And I was like, no, I have to carry on. But there were those moments. I think if you have the power to make a change that can impact a wide spectrum of people, that's what you should do. You know, when you think about the practical elements of a course, I wasn't able to access in my first three terms so many different workshops. And that was because of a lack of access and it's not acceptable. So, you know, it should have been established beforehand that there needed to be interpreters present in different workshops so that I could gain access more easily. And that was, that didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, it got to the point of ridiculousness for me where I was having to actively fight my disability advisor to gain access. Um, I wanted to be independent in the workshops. Um, that's something I've spent a lot of time in workshops before university, so I was very confident in them. And my uh, stage one leader was really supportive of that, completely trusted me and my view on that. And the head of the workshops, Billy, at CSM is amazing and completely supported me with that. Um, he's been one of my biggest cheerleaders the whole way through. But we had to have this whole meeting with my disability advisor where there's me and two members of staff who know the situation way better than my disability advisor. 
And they're saying that they want me to do it independently if that's what I want. I'm saying I want to do it independently. And he's saying, I don't think you should be allowed in there on your own. We need to get you someone who will just stand next to you and do nothing, but might help you if you need it. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a there's so much work to be done with disability advisors. Um, but it's it's a very difficult thing because they're done individually by different universities. I remember once having a meeting and an interpreter that was opposite me. And we were talking about trips and all the different trips that needed to take place. And I was asked whether I'd need an interpreter on the trip. So how would I gain access? And they suggested that I could use a note taker. And then I said, how would I contribute? I was really shocked by this because this is 2020 in education in the UK and I'm being asked this question. And there was this concern and worry about the budget. And there was a suggestion that I could, you know, create a YouTube video to try and gain funds to be able to have access. And essentially, I think for me, it was my first clear experience of discrimination in education. And I don't want anyone else to experience that. I don't want them to have to go through it because it's so easy to give up. And I think you've all spoken a lot about how much emotional and real time work you've had to put in throughout education um, and the toll that that can take and all the work while you're doing all this work, other people aren't doing it. Um, and I wanted to ask how you found it going into practice and if there are certain uh, boundaries you've managed to put in place to make sure you're not working overtime in an industry that already has that as a problem and um, yeah, how you're able to manage that and if there are any good things you've managed to do that you think we could all learn from. Um, yeah, I think um, it's been tricky adapting to work. Um, I didn't know how much they knew about disability. I didn't know who had been, when I started, I didn't know who had been told that I was blind. Um, so I kind of just had to go with it. I think when I'm nervous about the situation and I don't know what discrimination I'm gonna face, I just go into just saying yes to everything and being fine and being easy breezy and just letting access needs completely go out the window, which is really bad. Um, so I'm very much just living on a place of having perpetual eye strain and just about managing, um, and slowly building up my confidence and saying to people, actually, this thing doesn't work too well for me. Um, which unfortunately is the case for most people with disabilities. Um, I think access to work is a really great thing particularly for deaf people because it provides interpreters. But my experience of it as a blind person was, to, for starters, the waiting times at the moment are absolutely appalling. So I had to wait nearly two months. And um, for people that don't know what access to work is, it's basically a government scheme where they'll fund things that you need to be able to access the workplace. Um, it's also supposed to provide training to your workplace so that they're aware of your disability. But obviously, I'd already been working for two months when this came through as a potential. So it, we ended up not going for it because I was just like, I don't want you to sit through three hours of something that could be awful. That's the other thing. They suggested a company that didn't even do training on on vision loss, as it's re lo lovingly referred to, sight loss. I'm I'm blind that's how I identify um and so I I've not actually followed through on any of that and then on the practical things they suggested that I get a magnifying glass um which I have a lot of magnifying glasses I get given one every time I go to the hospital they're like do you want another one <laughs> um so that really wasn't necessary and then they also suggested that I get a zoom function on my computer which 
is already built in. And I told them is already built into the device. So they didn't provide anything that was actually helpful. It, for me, it was a very similar experience to the Disability Advisor at University. They have no expert expertise on architecture. They had no specific expertise on blindness. So it was, they come to you saying, what do you need? And I'm like, I've never worked in architecture before, so I don't really know yet. And you kind of have this little dance of being like, is there anything existing? But at the moment, it's just there's like a list of things they can offer you as a blind person. And none of them were going to be helpful for what I needed because all the barriers are so ingrained within architecture, such as the software being inaccessible. So um, that's been my experience of starting work. <laughs> My workplace have Tompkins. I've been very lucky in that respect because they've really adapted and made it accessible for me. Before I started full-time work, I had the internship at Half Tompkins and I loved it. And we worked really, really well together. And I thought, yes, I want to go back. Access to work and the budget haven't been able to cover enough for, for certain things that I've needed in the process. So if you don't have access to work, you won't have the same experience and opportunity. There needs to be a number of interpreters that are available for different meetings. So sometimes there's one interpreter book and that is not enough. There needs to be two. And often there's a six month wait for the budgets to be renewed. So I'm trying to figure out, do I have enough money for the interpreters? Can I book the interpreters? How many meetings have I got in the week? Will there be enough interpreters to cover it? And I remember when I started working, I didn't really have any sort of knowledge about access to work and the resources and the process. So I was sort of learning as I was going, but I was quite lucky because a friend was able to help me and gave me support about what I need to do. But I was struggling at the beginning and it did feel like a big responsibility. You know, there wasn't any readily accessible advice that I could go to. You know, I was thinking about booking interpreters monthly, how to find cover for different interpreters at different points when I was also working in the studio. Um, but when the studio took that responsibility for me and started booking interpreters for me, we will arrange them for me. It was great because it meant that I could just focus on my work and I wasn't on my alone with it if there are any issues. I initially, at the beginning, of course, it was a challenge, but I felt supported by Half Tompkins. Uh, that generally, in the workplace, there needs to be lots of improvements so that access is fully met, but, and that takes protest and activism. Um, yeah, I should just say, I do really enjoy where I work. Um, <laughs> sounded a bit negative. Um, it's just being realistic about how difficult it is as a disabled person to start work. Um, they're generally very supportive, although they didn't really know what access to work was when I started. So I'm kind of having to do the education as I go along, which sort of sums up a lot of the issues. But they, as a company, are very supportive and luckily haven't had too much overtime. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do really appreciate them. My workplace. The first week, they asked me to teach some DC, um, some uh, BSL, because uh, they wanted to engage with me. When so that when the interpreter's gone, they can talk to me. So that's really amazing. So that's why really I've been with them for such a long time because they're very, um, they're amazing. They've adapted to my needs, particularly around training. I mean, in university, it was very poor because I, I can't obviously type, watch the screen and the interpreter at the same time. Uh, you get lost. I mean, hearing people can, um, you know, carry on doing stuff and just listen, but I have to arrange to make sure it works for me. So I'll have um, a, a, work, a laptop, so I'll take time to look at the interpreter and come back and carry out the processes. So, yeah, so that's how it has to be adapted for my training. But, yeah, they've, they've been fantastic in terms of how they've done the adaptations. I just wanted to know if, Aaron, you wanted to add anything from, obviously not coming from architecture, but doing a lot of spatial work, whether um, you've encountered similar issues, both in education and in your art practice. Of course. 
of course, my lifetime experience of being self socially excluded and um, being thought of as, um, I mean, when I was at school, I was just treated as, as being like a potted plant, really, you know. I mean, my teacher didn't even know I was deaf, and I used to sit at the back of the class. And um, so I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, it's not a happy position to be in. But at the same time, it can be quite an interesting thing to experience. In terms of particularly when punk came along when I was 16, I just identified with all the other people who felt that they were so socially excluded on the grounds of sexuality, ethnicity, or any other form of identity whatsoever that wasn't the norm. So um, so one of the things I was talking about with the idea of deaf gay was that, thank God, I survived normativity. And um, that is uh, one of the things that I've gained. So this whole experiential background is, is complex rather than simplistic. And I would like to say that there is some gain to be had from uh, not being able to perform normativity, which is similar to social exclusion, I guess. I don't have the answer for you here tonight, manager. You should write a book about it, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's very inspiring to hear you guys speak about it um, and sort of put yourself in the position where you're actually fighting against it. So I've got autism and all the way through school, it's been easier to mask that and not have to fight. The, even through university, it was more difficult to try to get these additional needs met. So... I then developed a, you know, a way of masking and, you know, as sort of Aaron said, looking at the gain and the positive side of what I get from those sort of experiences rather than trying to fight for it. A um, couple of years later, now I've got a son, he's autistic as well, but it's so difficult in school for him. It's either, they either want you to tick the box or no. And what Aaron said, there is a sort of a spectrum around it. You know, you might need this additional help. You might not need this. So, the, the difficulty we sort of face is almost that you either have to tick all the boxes to give him all that support, or he is not eligible for that little bit of additional support that he requires. So I think the question I want to throw out to you guys pretty much is around how must the, how must the language and attitude of your peers and those around you who aren't, who aren't disabled, how would you like to see it or how must it change to it inc to include you and and you know what are what are some of the issues that you guys look at that you go I'm not being excluded just by the attitude or the vocabulary that they're using towards us. Can I just jump in there because um, I've always said that um, I don't really believe in the idea of non disabled that uh, I'm totally inclusive on the prospect of disability, you've all got it coming to you one day, you've all got, got it to look forward to, so um, I don't think there is like a divisive point between disability and non-disabled here, yeah. and uh, besides if you feel that you yourself are non-disabled, apart from looking forward to it in later life, you've also got friends and family and acquaintances and disability is a part of everybody's life, and that's the way I prefer to perceive it, you see. Yeah, I think um, it's a really interesting one because you have to, it, it's that thing of you, by disclosing, you also put your child in this position where they can't then undisclose it. Um, he's yeah, he's got the label. And then um, I know through school, I didn't really get much support. And part of that was because the only support that was available was the wrong support. Like it was a person sitting next to me in class talking to me as though I was a three-year-old and writing everything down and like it got to the point where my teachers were having to ask them to leave the room because they were being so patronizing towards me um and that's a really really difficult you you're kind of put in a position where you have to like choose whether to fully embrace the disabled community or not, which it's it's a it's a big decision when there's so much discrimination that comes with disclosing. Um, when it comes to peers, I think 
people would be quite surprised. But um, unfortunately, like particularly in my first year of university, like I would be walking along the corridors and people would sort of talk to their friends and go, she's not really blind to one another within earshot of me. Um, And so I think that was a particularly difficult thing was not feeling even that comfortable around some of the people that I was in a room with because I knew that they either thought I was faking it or they didn't understand it or they some of them would ask my friends about it and no one really spoke to me about it well apart from my friends who then became my friends because they were so relaxed with it um and I think when we're talking about Um, people feeling welcomed in institutions that needs to be more done in educating the student body on disability and what that means. I mean, it's also an issue when you have people coming from lots of different cultures, which is a wonderful thing, but lots of countries have different attitudes towards disability, um, have different language for disability. Um, I've heard some really rather offensive terms used within in my presence, not intended as such, but through not knowing what the sort of established language is in the UK. Um, But universities don't really seem to take that sort of education on diversity into account. And I think it would be really interesting for a university to try when students come in, opening up discussions about disability, opening up discussions about race, gender, sexuality with their students to hopefully get to a place where marginalized students feel more included because their peers have an understanding of that. Yeah, I agree. When I grew up um, first at primary school, I was in a deaf unit. Then um, uh, I went to a deaf secondary school, but it was an oral school. And I did find I, find I struggled with my deaf identity because I would um, use sign language. But then they forced me to um, you, to speak. And then obviously when I finished school, I went to university and then I had interpreters. And it was the first time I used interpreters to, to realise I had some rights and... And that's how I flourished in terms of my deaf community, because then I thought this is actually my right to be able to sign. So I can remember um, when I've met people and they've re- realised you're deaf, they say, oh, you don't look deaf. And I'm going, what, yeah. what, does, what, what do deaf people supposed to look like? And uh, it's a, such a silly question. Um, yeah, I mean, as you both know, the big question in the deaf community is about whether you're big D or little D, you know, it's like, as if it's a question of size, you know, how big is your D, you know, <laughs> and um, it's just a really yes. stupid government, you know. Yes, it, it, yeah, that conversation is, I, I, it really shouldn't be happening. Who makes these decisions about big D or little D? We are deaf and that's enough, you know, uh, and hard of hearing, just be clear about that. So I think, unfortunately, the old, yeah, the old um, terminology of hearing impaired is still used out there. It's not appropriate. That's a medical model and really that should be um, stopped from being used. It's deaf or hard of hearing, and that's really what most people <laughs> identify as. The, the problem of ring-marking disability in terms of um, in terms of scientific or medical diagnosis is one of ghettoization, that um, by excluding other people from being included into your identification, then you're just isolating the community. Um, I'm really sorry to do this because obviously this is a conversation that could continue for hours more and years, weeks, I don't know, probably forever um, until I guess much overdue change happens. But um, I'm conscious of time and I know that um, everyone's probably (laughs) quite tired, but um, I think, I hope that the conversation continues in, in many forms and I hope Lots more people reach out to you to form wider communities. I just when we just before we end, I wanted to actually do a sh- another shout out to Joss Boyce because we know we mentioned her twice in the beginning. But for anyone who doesn't know about um, the project she did called Disordinary Spaces, um, that's actually how I met Aaron um, because it was about creating workshops that could happen in architecture schools and pairing disabled artists with architecture students so that they can actually. Um, become more sensitive to this and actually it becomes a way that we 
um, all designed together. And so what you said about like a uh, puppy earlier about how to make sure that it's part of all architecture students' education, not just the people who have to like conform to what's considered a normative experience. I think that's really powerful. And I wish that Joss's program wasn't just the people who were, who, um, you know, were willing to participate, but it was actually rolled out as part of a kind of international or national curriculum because I met so many interesting people, but having witnessed, like Aaron did so many workshops with my students, which were really fascinating and they all got so much out of it and it should be the case for everybody and not just um, for, for all of you to have to conform to this weird standardized idea. But thank you so much um, uh, for today. Thank you to everyone for coming and huge thank you to both our interpreters, Amy and Anne, for everything.